Political news for Republicans is Ron DeSantis launching that presidential bid. He claims he's now running to Donald Trump's right on issues from COVID to censorship, a recurring impulse in politics, which rarely proves popular in the long run. It shows why there are, however, more instances of these crackdowns in America on learning history, on books, culture, freedom of thought. This is not new. It is a kind of a reboot or regurgitation of politics around censorship and government control. And the Harvard-educated DeSantis knows that. Well, politicians and governments try to censor and silence opposing views. We've seen that across history, especially silencing those who advocate more rights or new ideas. The Orwellian habit here is for those very politicians to claim they're for freedom or freedom of speech while they are the censors. And it is usually the writers and the artists who are deemed dangerous because they are the ones who offer hope or inspire change or stand up to power, especially when they draw on the influence and audiences available to those who prove popular in our culture. Music, so often at the forefront here from the Vietnam era to the civil rights movement, which brings us to our next guest. Joining me now is the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, author, and longtime editor of the famed New Yorker magazine, David Remnick, who has a brand new book among all his other work and pursuits, and it is an important one, Holding the Note, Profiles in Popular Music. Uh, David, I think viewers will understand, we always love to get you on the table, and I couldn't get more thrilled or excited about this topic with you. So thank you for being here. Thank you. It's a delight to be here with the most music knowledgeable guy on the air that I can imagine. Okay. Since Walter Cronkite. Wow. Well, you don't have to, that, thank you. You don't have to say that, but, but you're here because, and this is the big question, you know so many things. We've talked about your foreign reporting, and you were last on this program with the January 6th topic, and the New Yorker covers many things. Yeah. Why is that your view to do this right now? The music that you grow up on, between, to pick random ages from 15 to 25, something like that, 30, even 30, that embeds in you in a way that nothing else does. Let's take an old record off the shelf. Sure. If I may. Yep. Uh, respect. Mm -hmm. Natural woman. Yeah. Uh, what you describe as a reawakening. Let's listen to Aretha. Sure. Uh, we saw Carol King jamming out there. You write, what distinguishes Aretha is not merely the breadth of her catalog or the force of her vocal instrument. It's her musical intelligence, her way of spraying a wash of notes over a single word or syllable. Respect is as precise an artifact as a Ming haze. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, that performance is at the Kennedy Center. Mm -hmm. That is official a concert as you can get, and yet... She brought it like she was in church in mm. Detroit or in a nightclub in Chicago. And when, when Aretha sang this song on the St Kennedy Center stage in front of official Washington, in front of Obama, um, um, she was suffering. You know, she was coming to the end of her life. She was much sicker than anybody knew. Mm. And yet she did this thing where she stands up in that mink coat and suddenly the mink coat drops to the floor like you know, Mahalia Jackson used to do. Uh, and if you didn't feel the hairs on the back of your neck stand up, then you are dead in your chair. Mm. That was just an amazing, amazing performance. It, I just, you know, tears running down my face yeah. like a baby. I was thinking about how we know you from journalism in The New Yorker. If everyone says first draft of history, that's journalism. Uh, and how so much music is the first draft for at least the people who are clued into it. So sometimes that's younger people, sometimes it's intergenerational. Yeah. Um, we know that with social change. Uh, we know that with sometimes marginalized artists in America. You write about, you choose to write about Mavis Staples mm. and the Staples Singers. Um, one of many civil rights anthems that I believe take on a hue later mm -hmm. that they didn't always have for at least all of America and white American-led institutions right. at the time. Let's take a listen to Long Walk to D.C. Mm -hmm.
It's a long walk to D.C., but I got my walking shoes on. All the way to Washington. I can't take a plane, pass a train, cause my money ain't that long. That we can cry or mourn or fight, but also mm. share something that feels good, that gathers people together, that those aren't always in tension, right? And you write that the Staples singers were doing message songs, the lyrics got more insistently political, as important to the civil rights movement as a change is going to come. Um, commitment, you write, that Staples would go on upholding, and she admires the current crop of rappers whose music is saturated with politics and gospel, from Chance to Kendrick. Uh, explain that to us and how you wrote that profile story. So Mavis Staples was a kid. Mavis Staples was a kid in the Staples Singers. It was a, it was a group, an ensemble led by her dad, Pop Staples, who had grown up in the Mississippi Delta in the same area as Muddy Waters and Howlin' Wolf and, and so on. And their musical career typically begins in church, in church. So the, the tradition of spirituals and work songs and, 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 and gospel gets meshed with soul, just like with Sam Cooke, Otis Redding, all these people begin in church. Little Richard begins in church. And then different kinds of messages, different kinds of appeals, if not to God, then to Washington, uh, becomes part of their lives.